time because we're serious about saving lives and controlling the virus. And we will be guided by the science and the public health of the public and the country will always come first. Which is why we are implementing these restrictions at the border now. Our absolute priority remains to stop the spread of this infection, to save lives and to stop and prevent a second dangerous wave of this virus. That also means supporting our NHS and making short-term sacrifices together to stop coronavirus, taking more lives. I'm now going to hand over to Paul Lincoln from Border Force, who will update us, he'll provide an operational update, but also talk about the measures and how they will be implemented. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Home Secretary. Before we consider the health measures at the border, let me start by paying tribute to Border Force officers and staff, saying how proud I am for the professionalism and dedication which has been shown during this pandemic. In some areas, the context of our work has changed. This is most prominent area, of course, is in air passenger arrivals, whereas the Home Secretary has said at times they have been down 99% compared with the previous year. But elsewhere, the work has continued relentlessly. So despite the threats and challenges uh, posed by coronavirus, Border Force staff have been working tirelessly, day in, day out, in ports and airports, hand in glove with operational partners such as the National Crime Agency and counter-terrorism policing. And this is to keep the country safe and facilitate the repatriation of UK nationals from abroad. Throughout this crisis, they've remained on the front line and they have needed to. Organised crime groups and those who wish to do the country harm take every opportunity that every crisis provides. And we have seen some abhorrent attempts to exploit vulnerable people as a result of coronavirus. So as an organisation, we have turned to face the threat. Last month alone, Border Force seized more than 700 kilograms of cocaine and heroin destined for our streets, some of which were concealed inside shipments of face masks. In the last few days alone, we see significant amounts of contraband, including an AK-47 assault rifle, ammunition, nearly half a million pounds of illicit cash, and 20 tonnes of smuggled tobacco. We've also intercepted thousands of counterfeit and COVID-19 tests, continuing our battle against those who are proliferating from this pandemic. And between the 21st of March and the 15th of May, our officers referred, uh, referred 84 consignments of face masks to trading standards as otherwise counterfeit or otherwise below standard. We're also continuing to work against illegal migration. And in 2019-20, Border Force stopped over 30,000 illegal entry attempts at our juxtaposed controls overseas. But as well as tackling these criminal threats and working to keep illicit shipments out, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of working to expedite the entry of those items into this country that the country critically needs. Border Force has facilitated the importation of medical equipment and PPE for the NHS, for care homes and the police, as well as 220,000 laptops and tablets which the Department for Education are distributing to disadvantaged children to ensure that they can fully access remote education and support. It's also been important that we could help British citizens to come home. And as part of that, we were supporting the Foreign and Commonwealth Office with 469 repatriation flights, which brought home nearly 80,000 people. Turning to the new measures that the Home Secretary just announced, however, there are five key points which I want to make. First is that we're ramping up communications to make sure that anyone travelling into the UK is aware of the changes and the self-isolation measures which we've put in place. Second, we'll be asking people to provide their contact details, travel plans and details of the accommodation where they'll be self-isolating using an online form before travel, provided they are not in one of the exempted groups. The exempted groups are primarily to meet the UK's international obligations, to provide for continued security of supply into the UK and not to impede work such as uh, national security or critical infrastructure. The full list will be published shortly on gov.uk, but the list of those not required to self-isolate includes those such as road haulage and freight workers to ensure the supply of goods is not impacted, and medical professionals who are travelling to help with the fight against coronavirus, foreign officials who come to the United Kingdom to work on essential border securities such as the French police who operate in our controls and in the recognition of the unique nature of the common travel area, as well as unique position of Northern Ireland, all journeys from within the common travel area will also be exempt. 
obtaining people's contract details, onward travel plans for Public Health England and for the devolved administrations will support the test, track, or trace and equivalent devolved administration programmes. The more rapidly we can identify and contact those at risk of infection, the more effectively we can reduce the spread of the virus. Third, at the border, there will be spot checks conducted by Border Force officers. Any obvious errors will trigger a requirement for the passenger to complete another form or potentially be refused entry into the UK. Fourth, passengers will then be required to go to their place of self-isolation. And finally, as the Home Secretary mentioned, there is the question of enforcement, with the potential penalties for non-compliance of £100 for the fixed penalty for, not failing, uh, for failing to complete the form and £1,000 for breaching the terms of self-isolation. And in extreme circumstances, Border Force officers do reserve the right to refuse entry to any non-British or non-residents who do not follow these regulations. Given the high levels of compliance to date, we expect the vast majority of people will take this seriously and do the right thing. We will, however, take enforcement action against a small minority of people who may disregard these actions and therefore further endanger people's lives. The advice is quite clear. If you have the virus, or if you're displaying symptoms, or if you've been in contact with somebody with the virus, you should not travel. To do so otherwise is potentially putting people's lives at risk. We recognise, as the Home Secretary has said, that bringing these measures into force, there are sectors such as the travel industry who may have concerns, and we'll be working with them on the detailed implementation in the coming days, and we will also keep the measures regularly under review. We all look forward to a time when travel is fully back up and running, and when it is, Border Force stand ready to provide a warm welcome to the UK. In the meantime, it is essential that we use the levers at our disposal to ensure the safety of our communities while still facilitating in the critical trade into this country. Thank you, Paul. Patrick. Yes, can I have the first slide, please? I want to start with some numbers. And um, on the right-hand side of this slide is the R. And to remind you, that is the number that determines or is driven from the number of individuals infected by one infected person on average. And so uncontrolled, this epidemic has an R of three. It means three people on average are infected by one person and the epidemic grows very rapidly. If it's one, then one person is infected by one person and it's flat. We're currently at an R across the UK of between 0.7 and 1, below 1 in every area of the UK, we think, but potentially quite close to 1. So the epidemic is either flat or declining at the moment in the UK, and in most areas it's declining, as I will show you. As the epidemic becomes smaller, there are two numbers to concentrate on. One is the R, and the other is the total number of infections and the number of new infections. On the left-hand side, uh, side of this slide are the numbers that come from the Office for National Statistics survey where they've been to 14,500 individuals and taken swabs to see who's infected and also to see over time who becomes infected. And that's in over 7,000 households. What that study tells us is that in the two weeks from May the 4th to May the 17th, that 0.25% so roughly two or three out of a thousand people are infected and have COVID. That comes to a number of about 137,000 across the country. It could be bigger than that or smaller. These have got wide confidence intervals, but that's the sort of number. The second important number is the number of new infections. So this is people every week who are getting a new infection. And here, the number looks like about 61,000 people per week at the moment, which turns out to be roughly one in a 1,000 or so people every week are getting an infection. So that's the sort of order we are. The epidemic is shrinking, and the numbers will come down, but these are the numbers we need to keep an eye on because the lower we can get these numbers, the more possible it is to release measures and also to operate the test, trace, and contain system that's being put in place. Next slide, please. Just to show you what this means, and I, I've said repeatedly that this slide 
um, is difficult because the number of cases tested here and the number of people who are positive isn't a reflection of the total number. I've just shown you in the previous slide the to total number. But what you can see in this slide is the number of tests being done per day have gone up a lot in the pink columns. The number of people confirmed as a result of that is going down in the green. And this is from 21st of March, where we saw the peak to the top, and now it's coming down. So it's consistent with the idea. The number of infections in the community are coming down day by day, but quite slowly for the reasons I've said. Next slide, please. As you would expect, the number of people infected is going down, so are the number of people admitted to hospital every day. And here you can see right the way across Wales, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, the number of people in hospital coming down and the number of people on mechanical ventilators, importantly, are coming down. So we've got numbers of people in, on ventilators reducing the intensive care patients and the number of admissions, here the graph shown for England, coming down over time, each day reducing. This is an important indication that the epidemic is shrinking. Next slide, please. People in hospital with the disease are also reducing. And here you can clearly see the peak when you look at these graphs going from the 20th of March through to the 21st of May, most obvious in London, where you can see a peak occurring around the beginning of April and then coming down now day by day. And you can see it's a bit flatter in other places. So it's not decreasing at exactly the same rate across the country, but wherever you look, it is decreasing. There's clearly some work to be done to make sure it's decreasing everywhere. And these last few numbers are going to be hard to get down, but we've got to keep trying to push them down. The lower the numbers, the better. Next slide, please. And as you would hope and expect that as those numbers come down, infections, people admitted to hospital, people in hospital, people on ventilator beds, so the number of deaths reduce as well. And this shows the number of deaths from the uh, Department of Health and Social Care um, uh, numbers. They're a little bit higher if you look at the Office for National Statistics numbers because these are only COVID confirmed and the ONS numbers can uh, contain um, suspected as well. But what you can see here is a clear, again, a peak that occurred with a reduction now in the number of deaths. And I just want to pause here to say this peak is an artificial peak. It's a peak that we managed to suppress by the things that you have all done, we have all done, to adhere to social distancing. The risk is that if we move too fast and do things in the wrong way, we get a second peak that would look exactly the same, and that's what we've got to avoid. Last slide, please. So as a reminder, as some of the rules around this are relaxed, it's important that we do maintain the social distancing and we do maintain the rules around distance between people and our interactions. And it's really quite encouraging to see that still we've got good information, good knowledge that actually people are adhering to this on the whole. And of course, it's also the case that people are able to do more because of the relaxation of rules, and that's important as well for other health reasons. So everything pointed in the right direction. R between 0.7 and 1. Numbers coming down, but we need to keep on with it, and we need to make sure that we don't relax at the wrong time and end up with a recurrence and a growth again of this epidemic. Thank you. Patrick, thanks very much. Thank you. That's very, very clear. Um, I'm now going to move on to questions, and the first question is from Emma from Wildham. What guidance and advice do you have for couples who have weddings booked worth thousands of pounds in August and September? What number will you put on a small gathering? So for those that didn't quite hear that question, the question was what guidance and advice do you have for couples who have booked weddings? Um, now, I'm going to speak about, I've got friends who've also booked weddings and had to cancel weddings. I think we all know people who've been in exactly the same situation. Um, I think we've just heard from Patrick, who's spoken about making sure that we take the right measures in particular um, to control the virus. Um, but at the same time now, we know that everything that we do in terms of not just working to control the virus, but making sure we 
take individual responsibility um, is absolutely crucial. But I think, Patrick, perhaps on this point of gatherings, um, if you would like to just expand further about the best advice, because obviously we're not encouraging gatherings at all. Um, and we do want to uh, make sure that we can get into the position where people can obviously get back to holding weddings and living, living as normally as we possibly would like them to. Well, the, the science advice on, on transmission is obviously related to the number of contacts you have, the closeness of that contact and the duration of contact. And particularly, we've been aiming to try and break transmission between households and across households and, and other areas because that's what's kept this under control. So as uh, any decisions are made about relaxing those sorts of guidelines, and one of the things that's happened is a bit of relaxation in terms of outdoors, where we know transmission is much less likely, but any decisions to relax would need to be based on a risk-based assessment. And so the science can provide some guidance, but it can't choose the number. That obviously has to be a policy decision in terms of, of how government would like to take that forward. Thank you, Patrick. We have the next question, please. This is from Giovanna from Cambridge, who asks, when will dentists open and how will patients be safely treated? People are living in pain and delaying even small, a small problem can become a painful emergency. Um, Patrick, do you want to? Yes, uh, th this is really a, a health question yeah. um, and not a direct science one, but, but it is an important one. And it's clear that um, some professions are more likely to be uh, close to people uh, for long periods and you may get some sort of um, aerosolization of some of the um, sputum and so on. So there are risks in certain professions and dentistry is clearly one of those where that might be the case. Um, this is being looked at, I know, by the chief medical officer um, in terms of what could be done to reduce that. And of course, dentists are healthcare professionals who are used to working in environments where there's an infection risk. So I know that this is being looked at very carefully. And I know that the um, CMO and others are thinking about what the guidance should be that would allow this to happen. And I absolutely recognize that, that this is a key thing that people want to see open for all the reasons that, uh, that have been um, put by Giovanni. Thank you, Patrick. Um, can we now move on to questions, direct questions um, from the media? First question is from Tom Burridge, BBC. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, Home Secretary. I've got one question for you, please, on the quarantine, and then another question from a colleague about schools, if I may. Um, Home Secretary, uh, now that this measure is coming in, is it fair to assume now that most summer holidays abroad will not happen this year? And the second question is, while the risks to children are judged to be relatively low if schools reopen, to what extent might they be more serious for families and for the wider community? Thank you, Tom. Well, I think in answer to your first question, um, of course, you know, the advice is not about booking holidays right now. We are bringing in these measures for very clear reasons, as I have already outlined this afternoon, and Paul Lincoln has also explained how we're going to bring those measures in. Um, the other point to note as well is, of course, advice from government and the Foreign and Commonwealth Act office is, um, you're not to travel and please follow the advice that they are putting um, on their website which is nothing but essential travel. So this is, is, this is absolutely not about booking holidays. We have to be clear about, you know, we, we want to avoid a second wave and that is absolutely vital. Um, and I think in terms of your second question about schools um, and safety around children reopening schools, I think it's really important to recognise right now, many of our schools are actually open. Um, and many of those schools are doing fantastic work, obviously, providing schooling for um, children of key workers, but also equally as important, vulnerable children. There are many, many vulnerable children, hundreds of thousands of vulnerable children um, who are safer in school um, in many, many cases. But of course, you've asked the question about infection control and families, um, and that is, of course, something that um, has to be looked at um, very much in a local setting at a localised level, but also following the advice from government and the scientific advice, the advice that we've heard from Patrick and from other colleagues as well. Um, and that is crucial. And of course, the Department of Education and other colleagues across government are working on this and looking at this right now. Patrick, did you want to add anything to that? So the, the question, and you're quite right to frame it as that the, the risks for children are, of this disease are much lower. We know that. They are very low risk, but not zero risk. And there have been some serious cases in children, of course, but very few compared to adults and older age groups. Um, 
the risk, the broader risk in terms of opening schools is that as soon as you start to reintroduce any contact, then you put some pressure on the R and you put pressure on numbers, and that's true for anything that we're going to do in terms of uh, changes to um, contact. Uh, the judgment um, early on was that schools are a relatively low part of that, that risk, um, although there are other consequentials that happen as a result of opening schools, I mean, in terms of people going to business and other contacts, which can add to that. So there are various scenarios that can make risk lower or higher. Things like safe environments are important, things like class size, things like the um, uh, uh, amount of face-to-face -face contact. And these are things on which um, we've given science advice, on which policy can then be determined. Um, but it's worth absolutely reflecting that the overall risk, if you look at it, is not one that you pick out as a, as a high-risk area for R, unlike, for example, the, the point that was just made around dentistry, for example, where it, where it is. But it's not zero. I mean, there clearly is um, a consequence of reintroducing any form of increased contact. Thank you, Tom. I'm now going to move on to Sam Coates from Sky News. Sam, good afternoon. Secretary of State, um, two questions about this summer. Now, 12 days ago, the governments of France and Britain issued a joint statement which said no quarantine measures would apply to travellers coming from France at this stage. Today, in what you've announced, there's no exemption from France. Can you tell us what's changed over the last 12 days? And also today, Downing Street revealed that they're also looking at easing the measures you're putting in place today by looking at air bridges that seem to be being pushed by Transport Secretary Grant Schatz. Be honest, are you as keen on that as him? And if so, when's the earliest they could come in? And to Patrick Valance, sage advice on education actually seems to make pretty depressing reading. If you're asking the question when schools are going to be back up and running completely, back to the way that they were in January, do you think schools will be fully up and running in September? Or should parents start to realise that, that that's just not going to happen? Sam, thank you. Well, first of all, on France, I can say to you directly and to the country as well that over the last 12 days, myself and other colleagues in government, in fact, I, I speak to my French counterpart frequently on a range of issues, and I've also been involved in many of these discussions. The fact of the matter is, is that we have been working closely with um, the French government and authorities. Um, Border Force have also been involved in finalising much of these arrangements. Um, there are limited ex exemptions, um, and that's in the list that will be published this afternoon, which, when it comes to France, um, involves frontier workers and preserves the critical supply of goods, which is exactly um, what we have been discussing with our French counterparts um, 12 days ago and have continued to do so. Um, we'll continue to engage closely with our French colleagues. We do that all the time across government, and that is the right thing to do, while also keeping this list and all measures, as I've already said in my statement earlier, under review. Um, and you've asked again about travel, um, which I can fully appreciate and understand the nation wants to start getting back to living a normal life in the best possible way, hoping to look forward to the summer and potentially travel all over, um, on holiday. Um, I've already said the fact of the matter is, there is we're not advising when it comes to travel, and the Foreign Office advice is very clear, nothing but essential travel. And when it comes to air bridges, look, I think we should be absolutely open to all ideas. This is not for today, but this doesn't mean we should rule this out in the future. And the fact of the matter is, I spoke in my statement, in my remarks earlier on, about the travel industry, the leisure sector, aviation. We're at the forefront of a really dynamic aviation sector in our country. Aviation is, in fact, the lifeblood when you think about it, keeping, keeping people moving, but keeping goods moving as well. So we will look at all options, and I and um, the Secretary of State for Transport you know, will work with sectors and the industry to look at how we can naturally get the sector moving again. But it's important to emphasise we have to do this in the right way, in a practical way, in a responsible way and in a pragmatic way, but also when the time is right. And, if, and I think actually we will now look forward to engaging them to develop a plan as to how we can do that. I think we should be looking to lead the world when it comes to reopening aviation. But that's going to take time, Sam, and I think you've also heard that from Patrick today. Patrick. Well, just to build on that... Um, Chris Whitty has said, and I completely agree with him, this is not a three-month epidemic. This is a long-term thing that we need to deal with that will require some form of social distancing over a longer period until we get some form of 
treatment or vaccine or other intervention which allows us to manage it another way. So this is a long-term thing. I'm not going to speculate on, uh, on, on when decisions will be made by government on, um, on schools. That's for government to decide. But I will say a few words about um, what the sorts of considerations are that are important. The lower we get the numbers of new infections each week, the greater the chance of being able to do things. The more effective systems like test, trace and contain are, the more room you have to make other changes. The more we can modify environments to be useful to keep appropriate social distancing, the better things are. So there are a number of ways in which decisions can be made based on good scientific principles that allow you to decide when to do things, and they're dependent on those scientific principles and the time at which the data tell you that you've got the room to do them. And those are the sorts of things that I think will need to be looked at in order to make these decisions. And of course, it's really important to remember that within all of that, the basic hygiene things that we've talked about, that we can sometimes forget, hand washing, making sure that we don't forget about that as a route of transmission become an important part of this. So I think those are the considerations. And then it's obviously important that schools have to get back for education for young people at some point. And the question is how you factor those things in in order to be able to make the decision at the right time in an era where we're going to have social distancing for some time. Sam, thanks very much. I'm now going to move on to Liz Bates from Channel 4. Liz, good afternoon. Liz, you are on mute. Okay. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, yes, I have two questions on the quarantine, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, if people come into the UK and they don't have somewhere to quarantine for two weeks, what happens to them? Where do they go? Um, and secondly, if this is a measure that, as you said, is going to save lives, then why is it starting in June? Why are we not starting to save lives immediately? Liz, thank you for your questions. Well, I think, first of all, on your last question, um, as I outlined in the statement um, quite clearly, we've said very clearly now that as the number of infections within the UK drops, um, we have to now manage the risk of external transmission. So more people are now travelling, obviously because other countries are bringing in their own measures in terms of opening up their own countries and society. And so this is now about managing the risk of transmissions um, being reintroduced from elsewhere. Um, so that's really vital. Um, and that's why we're bringing the measures in now. Um, we want to reduce the risk of imported cases being introduced to the UK and to prevent and stop a second wave of this dreadful virus. On your question on quarantine, um, quarantining and people having somewhere to stay, well, I think it's important to reflect and recognise right now. Um, the number of people who travel into the UK are at an all-time low, 99% down compared to this time last year. Um, Paul Lincoln, um, Director General for Border Forces, already said in his statement too, um, that this will come in, I've said this, on the 8th of June. Um, we are effectively now working to communicate, obviously around the world, but through all the appropriate channels, um, what the process are that people will need to do, the steps to complete a locator form and also to provide data and to get ready to, if they do want to come to the UK, they need to have that accommodation. Um, that is vital and that is very clear in terms of the proposal that we are outlining. Paul, would you like to add to that? I can build on that if you like, Home yeah. Secretary. I mean, um, the, the statement itself says that if you are unable to provide um, your own accommodation, then we will arrange as government accommodation for you, which will be at your expense. And we have a service which we can provide in the very limited circumstances where people come in and they don't have accommodation. You'll be well aware, well aware that we already use immigration and other powers. Yeah. And if people do not have suitable means mm -hmm. and they are not capable of paying for their own way in the country, if they're a foreign national, then uh, they are usually removed. So we have these processes in place already. This is a relatively routine thing to be able to take forward. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm now going to move on to Gordon Rayner from The Telegraph. Gordon, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Secretary of State. Thank you. Um, the government's trying to build a global Britain initiative and attract investment into um, Britain at the moment to take advantage of Brexit when, it, when we uh, finally leave fully. Is there not a danger that in imposing this uh, quarantine uh, scheme at a time when the rest of the world is doing the opposite, uh, you're telling potential investors that Britain's closed for business? Um, and can I just ask the scientists to explain to people watching this why we need to put people under house arrest for two weeks effectively rather than 
sending them to be tested perhaps for coronavirus? Um, and could people be, um, who've tested positive for antibodies uh, be exempted from the scheme? Gordon, thank you. I'll start with your first question, um, which is absolutely a legitimate question. We are, of course, Global Britain, and our aspiration as we leave the EU is to be a dynamic player in the world, um, obviously more than open for business, but securing our way when it comes to trade and all sorts of investment opportunities going forward. The fact of the matter is, I think we have to put this into context right now. As I've said already, international travel to the UK has declined dramatically by 99%. Um, there are some some very clear exemptions that are being those lists that list is being published this afternoon. Um, critical workers, infrastructure workers, um, key categories are there. Um, these measures will be kept under review, and I really do want to emphasise that we are not shutting down um, completely. We are not closing our borders, and I think that people need to recognise that. What we are seeking to do is we are seeking to control the spread of the virus because we do not want a second wave of this virus. And and if I may, before I hand over to Patrick Gordon, there are some other points here to note as well. Um, this will come in place on the 8th of June. And between now and then, we'll be working with various industries, but also we will continue to work across government, with Public Health England, with the Department of Health and Social Care, to look at you know, track and trace, testing, by the time this comes together, we would love to have, and of course we want to have, a plethora of tools that can effectively support these measures of quarantining, but also post these measures, help us to look at how we can, in this measured and responsible way, open society in the long course, so much, much, much longer term, but in the right way, obviously based upon the science, based on driving the R value down in the United Kingdom. But first and foremost, we must prevent a second wave of this disease. And that's why we're bringing these measures in from the 8th of June. Patrick. Let me um, answer te the testing questions generally about testing. Um, so the reason that a, a negative test is not very predictive is if you've just caught the disease, you incubate it for a few days when you will test negative. You start to test positive, maybe at around five days, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit sooner. And you may be shedding a lot of virus for a couple of days then and for a few days afterwards. And then you gradually recover and may not shed. Um, so clearly it depends on the time at which you caught the infection as to when you should expect a positive test. Um, and that means that just testing somebody and saying you're negative doesn't tell you whether somebody's just about to get it in a week's time. So that's the reason for um, thinking about testing in that way. And your second question about antibody testing, we're much more positive that um, people who get infections do mount an antibody response. I think that's really quite clear now. The vast majority of people do get an antibody response. And um, we know that some of those antibody responses at least, and maybe all of them, but we don't know that for sure, but certainly some of them are so-called neutralizing antibodies. In other words, they would um, expect, you'd expect that to have an effect in terms of viral infection and transmission. Um, what we don't know is how long that lasts for, and we don't know how effective that is in terms of either preventing transmission or inf in preventing infection. So there's still work to be done to understand, and this isn't just in the UK, this is globally, to understand the significance of a positive antibody test. It's likely that it confers some degree of protection, but we just don't know, and we don't know whether it confers your, if you like, immunity against being able to harbour the virus and transmit it. So I think until we've got answers to those questions, and there's work going on now that hopefully will give answers to those questions, um, I think to start talking about um, immunity passports and uh, assuming that an antibody positivity gives you complete protection is, is really very premature. Thanks, Patrick. I'm going to move on now to Harrison Jones from Metro. Harrison, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pretty. Thank you. Uh, this week, the public have been blamed uh, as huge crowds of people struggled to social distance at beauty spots, notably beaches. But was that not actually inevitable, given that the government told people they could travel wherever they like and sunbathe? And what is your message to local authorities who don't necessarily have the infrastructure to safely support huge crowds? 
Uh, and one more, if I may. Uh, yesterday, you described those working in the NHS and social care as heroes. Uh, many of those heroes were born abroad and we clap them every week. But would a better way of showing our thanks to those foreign key workers saving lives, including the Prime Minister's, be making them eligible for British citizenship? Harrison, thank you. So first of all, with regard to your first comment about beauty spots, um, local authority, public behaviours. Well, look, I mean, we're heading into a bank holiday weekend um, and the weather is good. This is a beautiful time of the year, as we all know, and we all enjoy being outdoors. I think the fact of the matter is the British public have been incredible, absolutely incredible both in terms of their resilience, but also the way in which they have naturally continued to comply um, with social distancing, with government guidelines, followed the advice, followed the health advice, continued on the, pub on the hygiene um, advice as well. And that's been vital, as we've seen from the graphs that Patrick showed earlier on in terms of moving past the peak and now trying to reduce and control the spread of this virus. I think it's absolutely vital and important that we continue to do that. Um, it is inevitable that obviously the public will will be out and about a lot more. But of course, our message is clear for the public. Um, yes, enjoy being outdoors. We have encouraged people to go out, but we have put a very clear caveat around that. And this is all conditional. You can enjoy being outdoors in the sun, providing you are following the advice, um, and we continue to stop and contain the spread of the infection. The second point about local authorities is, of course, we are, we are seeing this now become a discussion much more about different parts of the country and the localization of behaviors but also controlling the spread of this disease too. And local authorities have an enormous role to play, and they are. I've, I pay tribute to them in terms of the work that they, they are doing. Um, they've had a great deal of government support also in terms of putting in practical measures too um, to continue to support people in the community and to control the spread of the virus. But what I would say is obviously we've got to stick with this, OK? We've all made big sacrifices. We do not want to go back to where we started before, and there is still much more work to do. And in answer to your question, yes, about our NHS heroes and those who are quite frankly working day and night right now to save lives and to continue to do amazing work in the NHS. I've said from day one, actually, the last time that I was here on this podium, that we keep all our immigration measures um, under review given these unprecedented times and challenges. Um, I'm also going to say, um, primarily because I did introduce the um, Immigration and Social Security Bill in the House of Commons this week as well, which is all about bringing in a points-based system. Our immigration system is incredibly complex, and I think this crisis has demonstrated that and shown the extent of that comple complexity too. You've mentioned citizenship and changes that we could bring in. That would need legislation going forward, but as I said, we keep everything under review. I'm now going to go over to Rob Merrick from The Independent. Rob, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Home Secretary. And uh, in recent days, you've made some announcements that have been widely welcomed to include uh, hospital porters and cleaners within the bereavement scheme to waive the immigration surcharge for health and care workers. Um, in each case, the government listened, the government changed its mind. So will you now do the same to give automatic visa, visa extensions to care workers and low paid NHS staff who are risking their lives at the epicentre of this crisis. Uh, why should doctors and nurses get those automatic extensions, but not their colleagues? Rob, thank you for your question. And again, as I've just said already, the work that we're seeing across the NHS is just absolutely incredible. Um, and I've also just made the point as well that, um, you know, this is difficult in terms of um, we've seen the complexities around immigration. But right across the immigration system, through these unprecedented times and challenges, we are supporting um, frontline health workers, social care workers. And obviously, we're finding ways in which we can support other care workers as as well across the NHS. Um, our immigration system is incredibly complex and I've said that I'm looking at various schemes, we keep everything under review. Um, in fact this point was made earlier this year as well with the Law Commission's own report on immigration rules where our system is complex. I want to simplify some of these rules, I really do, and so we're now looking at what changes we can bring in, um, very much in the same way as was announced yesterday around changes to the immigration health surcharge. I'm working across government with my colleagues, including the Department of Health to look at what we can do in this particular space. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm now going to bring this press conference to a close. 
Um, but before I do, um, I want to just pause to remember um, those who fell victim to something very different, actually, and people that fell victim to incredibly despicable acts of terrorism on this day. Three years ago, on from the Manchester Arena atrocity, and seven years after the horrific murder of Lee Rigby, we remember the innocent victims who were so viciously and so brutally struck down. My thoughts and all our thoughts across the nation are with everyone who lost their loved ones and suffered on this incredible, difficult day. We will always remember them. Thank you.